my heart like flowers thousands of times at the lotus feet of my holy master my supremely worshipable spiritual guru Asmadiya Paramarat Tatama Guru Pada Padma Niti Lila Pravishta Om Vishnu Pada Ashto Tarasata Sri Rupa Nuga Charivarya Sila Bhakti Vedanta Narayan Goswami Secondly I have my pranam thousands of times at the lotus feet of my guru's guru to Srila Prabhupada and all of our great spiritual masters in the tradition going back thousands of years to Sri Krishna himself. Yeah. Yeah. And finally, I for my pranam to all the assembled devotees. Today I was requested to speak on the very basic and introductory ideas of this bhakti tradition, bhakti yoga tradition. So uh, we'll discuss this verse from the 11th canto of the Bhagavad Purana. So we can chant together. Kaivalyam Sakhvitam Yanam Rajo Vaitam Vitam Chaya Radhiyam Tamasam Yanam 
In this verse, Sri Krishna is instructing his very near and dear devotee, Uddhav, about four types of knowledge. First, knowledge in the three gunas, knowledge which is the product of the three modes of material nature. And lastly, that knowledge which is actually transcendental. So, I think perhaps you are all familiar with the three gunas, the three qualities of nature. Yes? Perhaps some of you have also studied yoga. So, in the Sankhya philosophy, which is the basis of the, that is the metaphysical basis of the yoga system, and it, it is also accepted by Vedanta. It is said that this entire universe is the product of the interplay of three modalities of nature. That is, rajas, the energy of passion, uh, that which causes the kriya, activity. And then tamas, that is the energy of darkness or destruction. So we see everything in this world comes into being, it remains for some time and then is dissolved. So the coming into being of every object is caused by the action, kriya, of rajas, passion, the energy of passion and then gradually everything is dissolved because the rajas is unstable. And so tamagun comes and dissolves everything. And then there is sattva. Sattvagun is a very light, bright, illuminating and balanced. So the more a person ha is in sattva in their life, then the more they will be physically and mentally stable. So, in the yoga system, it is said, yoga chitta vritti nirodaha. Yoga means to arrest the vrittis, that is the waves, the turbulence within the psychological body, within the chitta, within the mind. So, all movement within this world is caused by pran. Pran. Pran is also called in Sanskrit Sutra Tattva. Sutra, uh, from this we have some cognates in English. The word to sew. When you sew something, then you need a thread. Or Sutra, uh, in English. If uh, you have an operation, then the surgeon may stitch it together with sutras. <laughs> yeah? So, these English words are coming from the San Sanskrit sutra. Sutra means thread. So pran is also called sutra tattva because just as in cloth the threads are going. If you have a cloth with a pattern, you can see the pattern is created by the threads going this way and that way. So in the same way, the pran is in threads called nadis channels called nadis. And that pran is interwoven everywhere. And the movements of pran in the nadis produces all types of movements, whether it's our physical movements of a body, our blinking, yawning, breathing, and all other motions. They're caused by pran. But not only these gross physical motions, but also every movement of our mind is an oscillation of pran. So when the threads, the sutra tattva, the threads of pran, which are interwoven throughout your psychological body, throughout your mind, they're oscillating, they're vibrating, then they produce waves. And these waves are what you call 
your thoughts and feelings and concepts. Yeah? Incredible. So, the foundational idea of Vedic knowledge is that we are all spiritual in nature, Atma. But in this material world, our Atma has become confined by identification with a gross physical body made of the elements of earth, water, fire, air and space. And within that, a subtle psychological body or astral body composed of mind, intelligence and ego. So, Atma is not the body, the self is not the body, or anything that happens to the body. And the self is also not the mind. Only due to the influence of ego, we are thinking, I am this physical form, or I am my collection of ideas and thoughts and memories. So this is all considered to be uh, avidya, or ignorance. So true knowledge, vidya, entails becoming free from the ignorance of identification with the body and mind. It's very astonishing, because we have many colleges and universities which are uh, meant to be giving education. But which college or university is teaching a person how to become free from avidya, the ignorance of misidentification with the external framework of reference, the physical body and mind, and come to know Atma, the Self. Unless one knows Atma, the Self, he can never be happy. Because the Self is eternal, the Self is joyful and full of knowledge, but the material body and mind are temporary and uh, prone to uh, suffering and destruction. So it's an incompatible situation for a transcendental eternal being to be trapped in temporary uh, and very inconvenient circumstances. And that position uh, does not uh, come to an end for those who remain in avidya because the activities performed by the body and mind produce reactions. And the reaction is that when this physical body is finished, then the mind will carry the soul to the next body, and the next body, and so on. So this is a, called the Sansa Chakra, the cycle of birth and death. It is long, long journey, and no way out, unless the living being has the good fortune to associate with a, a guru, a spiritual guru, who is enlightened, and can teach him how to become free from avidya, ignorance. Now, in this verse, see Krishna is describing the different types of knowledge a person experiences due to uh, the effect of these three energies of material nature. So first he says, Kaivalyam Sattukam Jnanam. If a person will live a life free from violence, Ahimsa, they'll be non-violent. If they'll give respect to every living being, and if they'll uh, cultivate Amanik Tvam Madambit Tvam Ahimsa Kshanti Ajavam Macharapas Mamso Cham Stara Matma Vinigraha Indriya Teshu Vairagyam Anahankara Evacha Janma Mrityu Jaravyadi Dukh Dosha Nudashanam Vittadesha Sevitvam In this way, in the Bhagavad Gita, 20 angas of jnana yoga, the yoga of knowledge, have been described. To always be humble, to be free from uh, pride, egotism, to be very honest, to be detached from the sense gratification, external uh, indulgence, and to aspire to live in a solitary place, to Always be aware of the misery of the endless chain of birth, old age, disease and death. That is the real problem. 
people think that our problems are uh, whatever the political situation or we have too many taxes or a financial situation or problem is my wife or my husband or whatever. But a person who is following the path of Gyan sees that these are all just corollary uh, problems. The actual root problem is the fact that my Atma is in this cycle of birth, old age, disease and death. This is actually the problem that needs to be solved. So to be very much aware of this and to cultivate the knowledge and fixity in Atma, these are all parts, the angers, the different limbs of Jnana Yoga, the yoga of cultivating knowledge. By living in this way and practicing this path of Jnana Yoga, one becomes very, very sattvic. And in that state of sattva, the buddhi, the intelligence, dissolves into the ego, and then the ego dissolves into citta. And then one has a realization that Everything is one. Everything is one. There's no ego anymore. There's no subject and object even. Sargam Karvedam Brahma. All the objects of the world, they're just different states of the mature energy. Just as in the ocean, there are waves, and the waves sometimes cause some foam and bubbles. But the form and bubbles last for a moment and then dissolves back into the ocean. Ultimately, there's just the ocean. So such persons are very much in sattva Then they see around, everything is the same. This person, this person, this person. They have no attachment, no aversion, no friendship, no enmity with anyone. Because what is the use? Everything is just bubbles in the ocean. So, Sarvam Kalvidam Brahma. I am spirit. Behind everything there is only spirit. And they experience Kaivalya, oneness. So, this type of experience is very much aspired for by those in the Vedic culture who follow the path of Gyan. And outside of Vedic culture, we see today those who follow the path of Buddhism or Jainism, and some esoteric or Gnostic aspects of, of <laughs> other religions. For example, in Islam, the Sufis, and sometimes within the Sikh religion also. The, everyone, all these different personalities are aspiring for this kaivalya, oneness. It's sometimes called nirvana, sometimes called the moksha, mukti, the liberation salvation of the self from the entanglement in the suffering of ego and to become one with the eternal spiritual light. So kaivalyam satvikam jnanam. Now notice that Sri Krishna is saying this understanding of oneness is coming from the material energy, from sattva from the balanced aspect of the material energy. So Krishna has given a warning in the Bhagavad Gita that jnana sangye na badnati sukha sangye na chanaka. Hey Arjun, a person who is very, very sattvic, very much in balance and in equilibrium, they become conditioned by a sense of contentment and by a sense of jnana, a sense of knowledge. They feel themselves to be wiser than all the foolish persons who are under the influence of ego. So, that state, that sattvic state, is also one type of conditioned state, one kind of bondage. But those who are following these paths, who are aiming at liberation, they think that, oh, this is the highest thing. But our Vedanta tells us, no, this is a sattum yad brahmadarshanam, from sattva gun, one gets a vision of the light of Brahman, an experience of the undifferentiated oneness, uh, undifferentiated nature, nature of spirit. But this is not the final beatitude. This is not the final uh, experience or potential of every soul. 
Now, in the next line, is it clear the first line? Kaivalyam satukam jnanam. So we see that most spiritual paths, they're cultivating sattva, the balance, the peacefulness, to experience this moksha, nirvana, liberation, salvation. But it's a sattvic experience. So then, now Krishna is saying, Rajo vaikalpikam chayat. When the mind is not steady, not in equilibrium, then the sutta tattva, the prana, makes the mind move and it produces the vikalpa. Vikalpa is imagination. Uh, but really it means the conceptuality. Generally in English when we use the word imagination, we think of... Oh, um, if I think of a flying horse, this is imagination. But actually, as long as our mind is unsteady, oscillating, with various attachments and aversions, and conceptions, material conceptions, so everything we are thinking is imaginary. It's all imaginary. You are thinking you are male, you are thinking you are female, it's imaginary. You are not male or female. You are Atma. Atma is not Strilling or Pumling. Masculine or feminine. Uh, that means material masculine or feminine. Hmm? You are thinking that you are young. You are thinking that you are old. This Kalpana. Only conceptualization. This is not true. We are all the same age. Eternal. Not a second older or younger. <laughs> So, we have so many uh, concepts in the mind and all the different types of philosophy. For example, in the Nyai school, at the logic school, among the six classical systems of Indian philosophy, the first is Nyai, the Nyai Sutras of Gautam Rishi. So, they try to explain that the cause of the form of things is called Jati or universal. And in, in Greek philosophy also, Aristotle and Socrates, they also posited that the potential of mature energy takes form and becomes actualized by forms, forms, universals. So, this idea of jati in the philo ancient philosophy of India or ancient Greece, this is also the vikalpa, imagination. There's no such thing as the, as the jatis, according to Vedanta. Modern people, they don't believe in this type of classical philosophy. Nowadays, people think that the world is uh, like a machine. Everything is working mechanically, by itself. This is a common understanding. But this is also very problematic, because Machines are made of parts. When you understand how a machine works, you're not concerned with what the parts actually are or, or how they came to be that way. You're just uh, uh, concerned with the operation of the machine, how it operates. So if you say that the world is uh, mechanical, then hidden behind this idea that at the bottom of everything there's some essential uh, fundamental part that everything is made of. But no such part has been found. It was once thought to be the atom. Then it was found the atoms were made of parts, and those parts were made of parts, and those parts were made of parts, and those parts are made of parts, and those parts are made of muons and gluons and strings and... and quarks, finally. Yes, quarks. <laughs> but not finally. There's no finally. No one came to the end of no. it. <laughs> so every, every step of the way was what? Vikalpa. Only conceptuality. Only conceptuality. So, of course, if you say that the world is like a machine, functioning like a machine, but a machine actually is created by someone with intelligence also. So even this uh, type of atheistic explanation is completely, uh, uh, it is self-referentially incoherent. It is completely full of contradiction. Because if an atheistic person said the world is like a machine, all machines are made by someone. They don't make themselves. So it's just... 
concepts, concepts. So what happens is, on the one hand, you have persons whose minds are very active with Rajagun, producing all these ideas and concepts. And they're quarreling with each other. Right? And then you get the persons, Kaivalyam Satvikam Gyanam. They're, they're above this. And they look down on the others who look on and say, you foolish persons. And the truth is beyond concepts. Right? If you go to South India, now some of our brahmacharis are traveling in Arunachala, in South India. So there is the many disciples of Raman Maharshi and, and others. Okay? So they teach uh, no ideas, no concepts, no mind, even. Osho will tell, no mind. <laughs> uh, as long as you're thinking about something, then you're wrong, because all the concepts are rajasic. So in one sense, there's a truth to it. There's a, there's a truth to that. But the danger is that the description of Sri Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the description of the nature of the soul, the description of the nature of God given in the Vedas, appears to be one candidate theory among so many candidate theories, which are products of Vikalpa, of the Rajasic mind. And so the mistake which is made by those who are doing the Jnana Yoga and the adv following Advaita Vedanta and Buddhism and so on, who say no concept, no thoughts, they reject all the vikalpa, the, the concepts which are the products of the mind. And among them, they reject also the actual transcendental description of reality, which is not a product of the mind, but which can only truly be experienced in the state of samadhi, in the state of trance. But, and that bhakti samadhi, not the nirvikalpa samadhi that comes from jnana yoga, bhakti samadhi. So, so we're just illustrating here how Krishna said in the Gita, those in the mode of goodness become conditioned by a sense of wisdom. I'm wiser than all these persons who are quarreling over the various concepts which are a product of the rajasic mind. So then, in the next line, Sri Krishna is saying, Pakritam tamasam jnanam. The knowledge dealing with the nuts and bolts of this physical world <laughs> is all tamasic knowledge. Knowledge in the mode of ignorance. Now one may say, no, no, this is very useful. If I know how to be a good electrician or a plumber or a mechanic, an engineer, <laughs> a chef. So, yes, these, all these types of mm, knowledge, they, they are useful. They have some practical use in the physical world for fulfilling our worldly desires and so on. But this knowledge is called Prakritam Tamasam Jnanam. It is Tamasic, of darkness. Why? Because as the mind is a product of Sattvagun, as the senses are a product of the Rajagun, so gross physical elements are the product of Tamagun. So expertise in all the various products coming from tamas, that knowledge itself is in the category of tamas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even though it may be a, a, a marvelous uh, and very uh, impressive by worldly standards, because the object, the objects uh, that this knowledge is concerned with are tamasic, so the knowledge itself is considered to be tamasic. So, prakritam tamasam jnanam, so then Sri Krishna said, Man nistam nirgunam smritam. But the knowledge about me is nirgun. So the knowledge of Sri Krishna is not a product of the mind. And it is beyond the kaivalya, the, one, the experience of oneness of sattva -gun. And it's definitely nothing to do with the gross physical elements. Mannistam nirgunam smritam. How can one receive this knowledge which is nirgun? Since every person in this world, their consciousness is immersed in these gunas, then this knowledge is not with the general people of this world. 
And neither can anything that they do or any investigation that they make bring the results that they can attain this knowledge. Rather, they attempt to understand everything by their mm, mental speculations just makes them become more and more confused. No one can get out from this material existence by their own effort. This material existence is, we were singing this first song that we sang today. Davana Rasama Samsara Dahani. The material world is like a blazing forest fire. If there's a fire in the forest, then no one knows how it started. And it cannot be checked. Even today, we have so much power, but when there's a, uh, a wildfire, then they, the uh, fire brigade come, they're dropping uh, water from helicopters and all kinds of things, but it just spreads and spreads, the wind blows it here and there. It's uncontrollable. No one knows how it started and no one can stop it. So this mature world is, co is compared to a blazing forest fire. And in that blazing forest fire, all the small creatures, the snakes and ants and various creatures living in the forest, they try to get away, but they all, they're all burned. So in the same way, we are in that condition. The fire of old age, the fire of disease and death and war and famine and all types of problems, they're attacking the living beings constantly without respite. There's a little break. Maybe you have two weeks holiday every year. <laughs> yeah. But uh, that is just only a little pause in the suffering. And, and generally people are, are doing things in, in, to enjoy, which create more heavy karma for themselves. The reactions of their karma come to them more strongly from enjoying in ways which are contrary to dharma or religious principles. So this world is considered to be like a, a blazing forest fire. And Patanjali says, uh, Saravam uh, Dukam Vivekina. For those who have discrimination, then they see suffering everywhere. A person who is not sensitive cannot see the suffering of others. But a yogi is very sensitive and sees everyone is suffering, even in their happiness. Their so-called happiness is just the uh, creating material happiness makes attachment to something. When we enjoy, we become attached to that. And it's only a question of time before we lose it. And so that happiness itself is just the prelude, it's just the preface to the encyclopedia of pain. <laughs> so a yogi who is actually sensitive can see this nature of the forest fire. So you can ask yourself, am I a yogi or not? Do I see that the world is like a ah, very sparkling, glittering playground full of fun and houses made of lollipops? <laughs> <laughs> or are we seeing the naked truth? The yogi sees the naked truth. Once there was one guru, and he wanted to do. He was living in the forest with a few disciples, and he wanted to do a sacrifice, a yagya, fire sacrifice. So there was one new disciple, and he told him, "I'll go to the nearby village and bring fire." So that disciple he set off. He went to a nearby village, and but he couldn't get fire, and he came back. He said, "Guru Deva, tell me where can I get fire? I could not find." So then his guru was a little bit disgusted with this incompetent disciple. So I just told him, you can go and get fire from hell. So then that disciple was very simple. He said, okay. And he set off and he made his way to Yamlok, the abode of Yamraj, the lord of death. And he went and he got there to hell and there was flames everywhere. And people were screaming in agony. And he said, to Yamaraj, oh please, can you give me, I, I need to take fire back to my guru. Can you give me a source of fire? 
Yamraj said, no, no, we have no source of fire here in hell. There's no source of fire here. So then he looked around, he said, but uh, everyone is burning in a blazing fire everywhere. How can you say there's no source of fire here in hell? Yamraj said, no, there's no source of fire here. This fire that you're seeing, everyone brought it with them. It was their own karma. And they brought it with them. It's not from here. So each person, by their activities, creates every situation. So there's no need to become angry with anyone, uh, to criticize anyone, to quarrel with anyone. We have made our own bed. And only we are responsible for the problems that we have to experience in our life, not anyone else. So this is one of the first important stages in spiritual life, to stop being in conflict with the environment and take responsibility for one's own situation and be at peace. Make your peace with God and the world. So, three types of people. Kaival Yam become Jnana. Those who have this Atvik Jnana, they also cannot get out of this material existence. Though they may have some experience of Kaivalya, and they think they're liberated, but they're not. It is said that some persons think that they are liberated because they had some glimpse of the light, the spiritual light. But to ask the Bavar, Avishuddha Buddha, but their consciousness is Avishuddha, it's not completely pure. Because Sattva is never completely pure. There's always some mixture of Rajas and Tamas. These three Gunas cannot be separated. It's only a question of proportion. But always three are there. So, Aruya Krishena Parampatam Tata, even though by doing hard austerities, they raise themselves to a high level of Sattva Gun. Patantya Dan Andrita Yushmadan Raya. Because they neglect to serve the lotus feet of Krishna. So they cannot find any grip or any foothold in that liberated experience. And they again fall uh, into the worldly activities. So Kaival Yam Satvikam Jnanam Rajo Vaikalpitam Tayat Prakritam Tamasam Jnanam Mannistam Nirgonam Svaram So how can a living entity come out from these three levels of uh, ignorance, knowledge and ignorance, material knowledge and ignorance, and rise above to the near Guru state, being completely free from any worldly contamination, relation and connection? So Krishna is saying, Man Nishtam. Nirgunam Svatam. Here, Nishta means fixity. And Nishta means dedication, devotion. So those persons who are fully dedicated to me by their body, mind and words, they become Nirgun. As it is said in Bhagavad Gita, Mancho Yavya Bicharina Bhakti Yogena Sevite Sagunam sanatityaitam brahmabhuyaya kampate. Hmm? Krishna said, those who engage in my loving service continuously without any interruption, they rise above trigun, sattvarajas and tamas. And they attain the brahmabhuyaya kampate. They attain the pure, purely spiritual platform. So how does it happen that one comes to engage in bhakti? Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu instructed Srila Rupa Goswami. He said, Brahmanda Brahmiti Kona Bhagavan Jeev Guru Krishna Prasadi Pai Bhakti Lakhvij. Brahmanda Brahmati. A living entity is wondering lifetime after lifetime. Thousands of countless lifetimes in this material world. Kona, 
Bhagyavan Jeev, some rare soul who is very fortunate, Bhagyavan, very fortunate. Then Guru Krishna Prasadi Pai, Bhakti Lata Beach, he, he, by the mercy of Guru and Krishna, receives Bhakti Lata Beach. That means the seed of the vine of Bhakti, the seed of the vine of devotion. Now, what does that mean? Because it's Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's habit to speak in poetry. Chaito Dharpanam Arjanam Bhava Mahadavagni Nevapanam Sraya Kalivachandri Kavitanam. If he wants to tell some philosophical points, he will not speak in metaphysical terms. He will speak about the moon causing the night blooming lilies to blossom and the newly married bride who is devoted to her husband and forest fires and cleaning mirrors. Like this is Mahaprabhu's nature because he's Rasik. So the Rasiks, they always speak in poetry, you know, in similes and metaphors. So Mahaprabhu is saying, uh, you will receive a seed of the creeper of devotion if one has the great fortune to meet Guru. And this is the mercy of that Guru and mercy of Krishna. So the meaning is this, that all of our activities begin as seeds. Right? Whatever you do, what do you like to do? Hand gliding? Water polo? <laughs> what do you like to do? Hmm? Latin American dancing? <laughs> what do you like to do? <laughs> Playing drums? What is your hobby? Going to the cinema? Eating chocolate cake? Anyway, whatever you do, everything starts as a bead, a seed. That seed means there is an impression in your subconscious mind. A samskar. Samskar means impression. And that impression in your subconscious mind is triggered by some circumstance and comes into your conscious mind in the form of a vasana, a desire. And now I want to do this. So even though each and every person feels himself to be independent and making choices right now in real time, this is not a fact. This is an illusion. Illusion of ego only. Only the seeds of desires which are stored in the subconscious mind are manifesting in the conscious mind as inclinations and desires and we just act on that. So even though a living entity appears to be free and he subjectively considers himself to be free, but one who has wisdom sees that he's exactly like a bull with a ring through the nose and his past karma is dragging him in whichever direction. So, every activity begins with a beach, a seed, in the form of a deep impression in our subconscious mind. So, all the activities that we do in this world give us the beach seeds, and they may be sattvic, rajasic, or tamasic. But if you we'll meet a person who himself is nirgun, consciousness is free from three gunas, a person who has realization of what lies beyond this world and beyond Brahman. A person who, who is completely under the shelter of Shuddha Bhakti, pure Bhakti. Then by meeting such a person and seeing them, by serving them, by being blessed by them, by hearing from them, then they bless us with a Vishesh Sanskar. Vishya Sanskar means an intense impression. And this Vishya Sanskar is a Nirgun Sanskar. It is not an impression of this world. The Tamasic Sanskar will make you be involved in the material activities. The Rajasic Sanskar will make you become involved in theorizing and conceptualizations which are all imaginary. And the Sattvic Sanskar will make you detach from this world and just want to disappear into the endless oneness or light, desiring mukti. So, these things are not valuable to the living being. But when we associate with a guru, a transcendental teacher who has realization of what is beyond this world, of Sri Krishna, then by hearing 
and serving them and pleasing them, they bless us and their Bisha Sanskar appears in the heart, in the subconscious mind. And now we become under the control of this impression. In other words, instead of just waking up in the morning and deciding, oh, today I want to play water polo, you wake up and decide, oh, I want to sing Mangalati. I want to go to the temple and in engage in kirtan, chanting the holy names and worshipping Sri Krishna. So, it's very incredible. Earlier we discussed how all kriya, all activity of this world is the movement of prana. Yeah? It's a movement of prana. So bhakti is also one type of prana, but it is aprakrita. It is supernatural. The material prana, which is organizing our body, yeah? <coughs> our body is being organized by prana, and depending on how contaminating that prana is, then we'll have good health or not so good health. For example, if a person will smoke cigarettes and drink alcohol and stay up late at night, then their pran becomes more contaminated and so their whole organization, even on the molecular level, on the cellular level, everything starts to break down and they get different diseases and cancer and so on. Mm -hmm. But if a person has a very clean life, for example, if the yogi, They'll do pranayama. So in pranayama, there's the kumbhak, rechak, purak, the retention of the breath, retention of the outer breath or the inner breath. And so when the movement of pran is slowed down by pranayama, then it, the, the, there is a rise of sattva in the body. And then the pran begins to reorganize the whole body, even on the cellular level, even on the molecular level, to its the optimum capacity. Mm -hmm. So if someone will do the pranayama, pura, krecha, kumbak, breath retention, and they can hold their breath for a long time and slow down the pran, then automatically the whole body starts to become alkaline. Mm -hmm. Because growing old means you're becoming more and more acidic. So even on the molecular level, there's organization and the body starts to organize itself to become alkaline. There's a transference of the oxygen from the red blood cells into the tissues and into the brain. So you become strong and, and bright and alert. And as the, if the breath retention will go on longer, then even the spleen, which has a large uh, quantity of red blood cells which are kept only in store and not used, the spleen will, squeeze, will, the, the spleen will squeeze and release into the body about 25% more red blood cells than you had before. Hmm? Even it will produce the body to produce the hormone, the EPO. You know, there's a athletes who want to cheat in the Olympics, they inject themselves with this hormone. But if a person will do pranayama, then the body starts to produce this the hormone by itself to become much more stronger and healthy. So, the, we see that when the pran becomes more contaminated by tamagun, then the whole functional organization of everything on the molecular and cellular level starts to go into the state of destruction. And when the person does pranayama and increases the sattva gun, then the entire organization on the molecular level and on the um, cellular level becomes goes to its optimum state. It's really quite uh, incredible. So you should know without a doubt, scientifically it can be shown, that the pran is the organizational principle of this body and even all aspects of the universe as well. This is explained in Srimad Bhagavatam and uh, Bhagavad Gita also. So, pran is the organizational principle of the material world. But this is Prakrita pran, material pran. And in the spiritual world, the organizational principle is also pran. But that is our prakrita, supernatural pran. It is the kriya shakti, the swarup shakti, the uh, and spiritual energy by which all spiritual activities take place. Now, you know that singing is one type of pranaya. In the, if you learn singing in Vedic culture, then the first thing you have to learn is how to sing the Shuddha Swa, the pure notes. So then you have to just hold one note. 
and practice long how how long you can make this one should this pure note Re and you have to practice each note and practice holding it for as long as possible without wavering and keeping the should the swa. So singing is also in the Vedic culture considered to be one type of pranayama. Mm -hmm. That is a discipline of the breath control. Because the production of sound from the body begins with the movement of prana in the Mul Adha Chakra. So if you see all the main religions of the world, whether it's Christianity, or Islam, or Hinduism, and our within Vedic culture, our Bhakti culture, there's a great emphasis on singing. So why is that? Is it a social event? We all get together and drink some non-alcoholic beverages and have a sing song. Is it a social one? No, no. It, people have, uh, by and large, forgotten. In Previous times people knew, you come together with your community and sing and praise God. And the reason for it is this, that when you sing and you glorify God without any motive, without any personal desire, only to please God, then the aprakrita pran, the supernatural pran, the spiritual energy, mixes with your own prakrita pran, and begins to take over your senses and your mind. So just as all your thoughts previously, your vikalpa, your imaginations, your ideas and your desires were coming from the movements of pran, prakrita pran, material pran, before, now simply by singing the, pra the praise of Supreme Lord, by chanting the holy names, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, 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 Hare Hare. There is a gradual appearance of Aprakrita Pran, supernatural spiritual Pran, and it takes over your senses, so the senses become not engaged in karma, reward seeking activities, or sense gratification, but the senses engage in only the service of God. And that the mind, instead of thinking material thoughts, material memories, and uh, moping and dwelling on the happiness and distress of life. Uh, but rather, every thought in the mind becomes enlivened, uh, illuminated, prakashita, with the beauty of Sri Krishna. So Srila Rupa Goswami has said, Avibhuyat mano brito prajanti tat sarupatam swayam prakasharupapi Basamana Prakasavat. Just as God comes to this world in an avatar, he descends in an avatar to this world and plays, performs his pastimes here. So in the same way, what is bhakti? Bhakti is an avatar, a descent of Aprakrita Pran, supernatural pran, which makes its appearance in your chitta vritti, in the movements of your mind, and becomes one. Your mind is moving. Hmm? But you are chanting Hare Krishna and thinking of Krishna. And at that time, by the blessing of Guru and Krishna, the Aprakrita Pran comes and mixes with your own Pran and takes over. And now the supernatural Pran has taken control of your psychological functions. Now you are able to remember, to experience and to see the transcendental realm. So this, the visions of the saints in Samadhi, the visions of Krishna, of God, experienced by the saints in Samadhi, is not imagination, this is not Vikalpa. It is the actual here, Swayam Prakasa Rupa Pif Basamana Prakasyavat. This Aprakrita Pran is Swayam Prakash, that means self illuminating. And it fills the consciousness with the light, and that light, very condensed light. Chidanandam Jyoti Param Apitat Aswadyam Apicha. 
the condensed light of spiritual energy becomes relishable in the form of Goloka Vrindavan, the spiritual world. So, this divine revelation of the transcendental world, of Sri Krishna, his associates, and our eternal loving service to him, it comes uh, from this practice of bhakti. So, Sri Krishna is saying here in the last line, Man nistam nirgunam smritam. The knowledge of me is not of the three gunas. It is transcendent. So, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he told Rupa Goswami that Brahmanda Brahmate Kon Bhagavan Jeev, Guru Krishna Prasadi Pai Bhakti Lata Beach, after wandering in many lifetimes, if we are very fortunate, we meet a saint. And by the association of that saint, this movement of Aprakrita Pran touches our heart and makes a samskar deep impression. And we become under the control of that impression now. So this impression has been likened to a seed. It is Krishna Seva Basla, that is I want to serve God. I want to serve Krishna. And it is likened to a seed. Because Mali Hoi Kari Sei Bij Arohan Shavana Kirtana Jale Kari Chan. You have to be like a gardener. When a gardener plants a seed, then he watches it very carefully and gives water every day so that he's tending it with great patience so that it will grow. So in the same way, once by the mercy of a saint, we receive the seed of desire to serve God, then you have to be like a very patient gardener and tend to this seed, protect it in all ways. If a seed is sprouting and beginning to grow, then a bird may come and eat it. So it's important to give some protection. And that protection is Sadhu Sangha, the association of devotees. When we're in the company of saints, then there's no scope for worldly activities. But when we're in the company of materialistic persons, then the mind becomes buzzing with mundane interference. Mm -hmm. You cannot get, tune into the channel of Goloka Vrindavan, only zzz, all static is there in the mind. So be very careful. Mm -hmm. Rupa Goswami said, Jana Sangha Stalo Yam Cha Sadbe Bhakti Vinashiti. Among six things that destroy bhakti, one is very, very dangerous Asat Sangha. The association of worldly minded persons. When we love to be with devotees, or if we cannot be with devotees, then we would rather be alone. Then Krishna very much appreciates this. And Krishna is very gentle and very shy, but he will approach you. When you chant the holy name, see Krishna will come. But if you are associating with the very harsh and angry, lusty, worldly-minded persons, then Krishna will be very far away. So be careful. This Bhakti Lata Bij has to be protected uh, from the wild creatures, various uh, predators who will come and, and devour it, destroy it by a good fence of Sadhu Sangha, pure devotee association. And you have to give water every day. That water is Shavana Kirtana Jale Kareya Sichan, hearing and chanting. So there should be pure water. If we associate with advanced Vaishnavas who have realization of Krishna, they will speak very pure and beautiful, powerful kata of the pastimes of Sri Krishna. And then we'll have to also repeat that. And chant the holy names every day. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna. Hare Hare. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. Rama Rama. Rama Rama. Rama Rama. Hare Hare. And uh, if one will go on like this, a miracle will happen. That is, that the seed sprouts and begins to grow. Upa Jiva Bodhilata Brahmanda Bedi Jai. Viraja Brahma Loka Bedi Parabhyoma Pai. It starts to grow. And it pierces the covering of the material universe and goes into the Brahman. That means that before 
our thoughts and moods were related to this world. But now, as we go on chanting the Holy Name, our inner sanctity becomes such that there's no touch of material thoughts. And all identity, identification with the physical body and mind goes away. That means that this, the creeper of devotion has pierced the covering of the universe. That is the Brahman, realization of Brahman. And after that, then one can realize hmm, Paravyomapai means Vaikuntha. One begins to have a realization of God, but God in his powerful aspect. As the Vaikuntha Nath, the Lord of the Vaikuntha, all pervading, all powerful, all knowing, worshipped by the Vedas personified, and great sages and rishis offering prayers and Vedic mantras, riding on Garuda, the eagle Garuda. So this powerful realization uh, of God will come. But one should uh, not stop there. But keeping in one's heart the sambandha, the relationship which has been imparted by Guru at the time of initiation, and keeping this relationship, cherishing this within the heart, one should go on chanting and gradually the Kripa arrives in Goloka Vrindavan where the hot rays of opulence become cool and Krishna is there, Krishna Chandra shining like the moon with a very soft and cooling rays of Madhurya sweetness. The Aishwarya, the power of God, causes one to tremble. But the sweetness of Krishna, the nature of sweetness, is the Manoharitva, that it is charming. Manohar, it steals your heart. You don't tremble in fear and awe, but rather you just forget, who am I, where am I? He's so beautiful. Yam Shama Sundra Machintu Gunas Rupam Govinda Mari Purusham Tamaham Bajami Premanjana Chuta Bhakti Vilochanena Santaksa Deva Vijayeshu Vilokha. So that means that the devotee is here in this world, but when he's chanting the holy name, his heart, his consciousness has arrived in the transcendental realm, the Goloka Vrindavan, and there on the vine of bhakti, the fruit of praying, pure love, very juicy and delicious, has appeared. And though the devotee is in this world, but he can taste the sweet fruit of Krishna praying in Goloka Prandava at the time of chanting the holy name. So, Sri Krishna is saying in this verse, Man nishtam nego nam smritam The knowledge of me, this realization of my eternal service and my transcendental abode, it is nirgun, it is outside, the material universe. Are there any questions? Hey. Are there any questions? Yes, go ahead and ask. Oh, just, just curious, how is sometimes the body is very intensified that practice in such a good whole life? People are diseased and even die from Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, how is that? So yes, yes. So, yes. If someone does a very hard yoga sadhana, then they can live for many years. I knew one mm, devotee and yogi in Vrindavan, and he was 156. And not so long ago, just within within memory to about the 80s, there was one sadhu just across the river from Keshigat on the other side, Devra Baba, and he was about 250 years old. So those who are doing the yoga sadhana, they can live for an extended period of time. But this is not our concern. <laughs> we are not concerned with this. Uh, because bhakti is very powerful and in one short lifetime, a person can become uh, perfected. So, the whatever disease or problem is coming in the pure advanced devotees, this is not a material thing. It is said, Vaishtavera yata deki vyavahara duk nishya janee se parananda suk. 
which means if you see that a, a Vaishnava, a saint, is undergoing some worldly difficulties, then you should think, no, actually that person is experiencing Paramananda Sukh, this highest joy. Because Bhakti is Amrita, it is immortal nectar. And by practicing Bhakti, the identification with the body gradually diminishes and down to zero. And the soul manifests a very beautiful eternal spiritual form, an eternal <coughs> body, which will not last a hundred years or two hundred years or three hundred years. It's eternal. So the Vaishnava is already young and fresh and immortal, beyond birth and death. But Yoga Maya manifests the gradual uh, passing away of the physical body. And this is only to maintain the confidentiality of Bhakti. It is to maintain the confidentiality of Bhakti. For example, Srila Vishnata gives the example of uh, Krishna's pastimes. In Krishna's Leela, his associates, the Yadus, they, had a, they got drunk and had a fight and they killed each other. And then Krishna was shot in the foot by a hunter and he died. So actually this didn't happen. Only this was shown to the worldly-minded persons uh, to uh, maintain the confidentiality of Krishna Leela. So in the same way, the pure Vaishnava, they never grow old and become diseased and die. Only the mature energy shows this to the worldly-minded persons uh, to hide from them the glory of bhakti. And sometimes, to express the glory of bhakti, a devotee may go to the spiritual in the self-same body. And the example of that is Dhruva Maharaj. When Dhruva Maharaj came to the end of his life here, then an airplane came down from the Ramapriya Vaikuntha. And as Dhruva, he gave pranam and he did program of that airplane. And as he was about to step onto the airplane, it said that his body suddenly became very effulgent. And it means that when he stepped onto the airplane, now he had a fully Satchidananda spiritual body. And he went to the Rama Priya Vaikuntha in a form which exactly resembled the form that he had in this world as Dhruva. Mm. Mm? Apart from the fact that it was much more shining, it was mm. much more effulgent. Yeah. So, when the devotees are very advanced, then don't think that they get old age and disease or anything like this. You can think of it just like, you know that Giraj Govardhan, at the time of Krishna's Leela, was eight miles high. But now you see Govardhan is not so such a big mountain. Right? So some people say it's because he was cursed by the Pulasti Rishi to shrink the size of one mustard mm -hmm. seed every day. But who's Pulasti Rishi? Who, what can he do? Uh, he's just a Brahmavadi from, from Kashi. Uh -huh. How can he give a curse to Giraj Govardhan? It's impossible. Yes. So the reason Govardhan has become small and lean and thin is due to the intense separation from Radha and Krishna. And Govardhan is all in pieces, small pieces. Why? Because his heart was broken when Radha and Krishna left this, became unmanifest from this world. His heart was broken into millions of pieces. So Giraj Govardhan is like this. So one should see that the Dham is manifesting this very sorry and, sorry and pitiful state due to intense brain. So in the same way, you can see a Vaishnava. Actually, you may be thinking, oh, they're growing old, they're becoming diseased. But really, this is their ecstatic mood. When Srila Prabhupada was about to pass away from this world, his body was in convulsions, and the devotees didn't know what to do. And my Gurudev came there and whispered a mantra in his ear, and then he became peaceful. And uh, then my Gurudev said, oh, don't see this in a material way. He was, he was not convulsing due to some disease. It was actually a spiritual ecstasy. And look at his posture. He was in a posture like this, like dancing in Rasul. <laughs> huh? So we should not see the advanced saints from a material vision. Uh, but only those who themselves are advanced can recognize the nature of the ecstatic, their ecstatic pastimes. Another question? Anyone else have a question? Don't be shy. Raise your hand. She has one. She does. I know she has one. <laughs> <laughs>
Yes, yeah, sweet. <laughs> So, Gurudev, so when you were saying like um, there is uh, the impressions that lead us to doing things, um, there isn't any free will. Oh, the free will is to surrender to Krishna or not. But when when the material energy is here and material spiritual energy is there, we can turn our attention towards Krishna or turn our attention towards Maya. So when we turn our attention towards Maya, then Maya takes over and then the the actual details of what we'll do under the grip of Maya will be the reactions of the past karma. You see? So the soul has free will. Soul has free will. But it's very minute and it's directional. It's not a free will in terms of the details of the activities that he'll do in the world, but in terms of the degree to which he surrenders to the grip of the material energy and then his samskars will take over and dictate what he should do or what he should not do, what he will like and what he will dislike. Another, any other question? Yes. Uh, we talk of eternal sarupa, so there may be many devotees like of Sri Ram and other mm. other uh, incarnations like Lord Narasimha. So when we say eternity, that's relative eternity or absolute eternity? Eternity is always absolute. <laughs> <laughs> they never get the chance to go further. Um, everyone is satisfied with whatever sarupa they have. Absolutely. Yes. Completely. Everyone is, if someone is in the mood of a servant or in the mood of a friend or the mood of a parent or in the romantic mood, whatever mood this, that soul is in, in relation to God, he thinks this is the best. Are there no cases where, wherein they go further? Yeah. How will it happen? Uh, there's not any possibility, but there's only one possibility. Krishna. No. <laughs> Gauranga Mahaprabhu. <laughs> because at the time of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, all the incarnations enter into the body of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and all the devotees of those various incarnations come as well. So by Mahaprabhu's mercy, they may have the opportunity to experience uh, the service of Krishna. It may, it may be. But sometimes not. You see, for example, uh, Rupa Goswami's uh, brother, Anupam. Anupam was a devotee of Lord Rav. And he had the association of Rupa and Sanatana Goswami, and they were telling him, you should worship Krishna, this is a higher rasa. But he couldn't do it. Also Murari Gupta. Murari Gupta was, Mahaprabhu himself told him, you should worship Krishna. But he, he, he thought, I, I'll kill myself. Because on the one hand, I cannot disobey Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. On the other hand, I cannot, I, I've sold my head at the feet of Lord Ram, I cannot take it back. Hmm? So he was in a great quandary. So then Mahaprabhu, he, Mm, wrote on the forehead of the mm, Murari Gupta, Ram Das. <laughs> Very good. You just be fixed in your service to Lord Ram. So it's possible that Chaitanya, in Gora Lila, Mahaprabhu may give opportunity for some uh, jivas to have an experience of Krishna Lila. But that is exceptional. In the general case, everyone has Nishta in their Ishta. Right? They are fixed in their one Ishta. Day. Because that's the nature of bhakti. And Madhya Shoda does not want to be in Madhya Rasa. Uh, she just wants to love Krishna as her child. The coward boys, they don't want to be in Madhya Rasa. They just want to be Krishna's friends. Gopi is always crying all the time. <laughs> uh, we can be with him anytime in public. We can embrace him. We can go into his bedroom anytime and see him. Uh, and these gopis always get locked in their houses. And, uh, <laughs> So everyone, everyone likes their own rasa, their own relationship. Gaur Premanande Hari 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 Hari